live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Teams uh, live event about the APEGS academic review process. Uh, there may be a little bit of a time lag um, between the speaking and the slides and the answering of questions, so I'll try to uh, take this slowly and pause from time to time. You should have all received uh, instructions on the protocol for this Teams live event, but I have a few slides here at the beginning and I'll give you a little bit of time uh, to read those, but you might want to have that instruction sheet handy uh, in case you want to ask a question and you're not quite sure how to do that. So your attendees are not able to speak, so all questions have to be done through the Q&A and you can access that in the top right hand corner uh, of your screen. So questions that are of interest to the whole group will be uh, answered and posted for everyone to see. Questions that are repeats or are not relevant will be dismissed without being answered. Questions that can be answered but are not relevant to the whole group will be answered privately and then dismissed. There will be a, a question and answer session at the end. So questions that are going to be answered by me at the end verbally uh, will be posted at that time. But uh, I have several members of my staff here helping to answer questions as we go through and they will let you know if your question is going to be answered verbally at the end. If you have any questions about your particular situation or the status of your file, please send that to the questions academic review uh, mailbox because we'll need to have access to your file in order to answer those questions. So we'll not be able to answer any of those types of questions today. If you uh, need to leave the event uh, at any time, you can do that just by closing the browser or um, clicking on the, the leave button in the top right hand corner. So make sure that you're watching uh, the live telecast. Sometimes you can get out of sync with uh, the presentation. So uh, ensure that you're actually watching it live. All right, well, hopefully most everybody has managed uh, to join by now. So I'm going to get started with the actual presentation. So my name is Kate McLaughlin and I'm the Director of Academic Review at APEGS. And today's presentation is about the application and academic review process, specifically for internationally educated applicants, because the process is, is different uh, for you than it is for Canadian graduates for this part of the process. Uh, as I mentioned before, I have a number of the academic review staff standing by to answer questions throughout the presentation, so they'll be doing that in the uh, Q&A box, but I will be answering some questions verbally at the end of the presentation. So here's a brief outline of the presentation. I'll talk a little bit about 
um, APEGS, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan. I'll talk a little bit about uh, why we have uh, licensing of engineers and geoscientists, and then I'll focus on the uh, process of becoming a member in training, and then we'll have the Q&A. So APEGS is an independent nonprofit organization. Although we are authorized by the provincial government to, to do what we do, we are actually not part of the government, um, but our work is enabled by an act of the provincial legislature. We have approximately 14,000 members and license holders. We don't receive any funding from the government, so we are funded completely by application and license fees. We have about 25 staff and about 200 active volunteers. 19 of those are on our council and council is the highest uh, level of decision making within the organization. So in this section, we're briefly going to review the legal framework for professional regulation in Canada. So we'll talk briefly about the Engineering and Geoscience Professions Act, the role of society, uh, what we mean by self-regulation, and uh, what is a profession in the terms of uh, professional regulation in Canada, and right to practice. So uh, the Engineering and Geoscience Professions Act is an act of the provincial legislature uh, and it gives APEGS the authority to regulate the professions and to create administrative and regulatory bylaws. So you can find out about the um, act and bylaws on our website and because of this act, uh, APEGS is legally responsible to the people of Saskatchewan for licensing engineers and geoscientists in the province and for regulating the practice of these professions in the public interest. Through the Act, the provincial legislature and the people of Saskatchewan have given the professions the privilege and authority for self-regulation. So essentially the act is a social contract between the professions and the public. So the role of APEGS is really to regulate the professions and protect the public and the environment. Our role is not there as a service to our members. We try to provide good service to our members, but our main uh, regulatory function is to regulate the professions in the public interest not in the interest of our members. So all professions in Canada are self-regulating under provincial and territorial legislation. So that means that in each province there is a similar organization to APEGS that licenses professionals, both engineers and geoscientists and many others. Um, and the members of the profession regulate themselves by ensuring that uh, everybody uh, who is practicing is licensed and that only people that are properly qualified can get licensed. And the reason why the profession themselves do the regulating is that professional practitioners are thought to be in the best position to judge who is competent to practice rather than having people that are not in the profession trying to determine that. It's determined by um, other professionals that are practicing. So for the purpose of professional regulation in Canada, these are some uh, definitions of profession and professional that are relevant. So uh, all of the regulated professions in Canada require 
uh, specialized knowledge and long academic preparation in order to qualify. Uh, and this distinguishes it a little bit from things like trades where it's a lot of it is practical hands on experience. It doesn't have that theoretical background. Um, uh, another very important and essential element of professional regulation in Canada is that professionals assign their highest obligation to society above all others. So all of the professional, uh, all the professions that are regulated in this manner in Canada are types of professions that serve the public. So doctors, lawyers, dentists, engineers, geoscientists, and they are regulated so that they always put the interests of the uh, public and the environment uh, above all others. And what that means is in cases of conflicting responsibility, um, all professionals, including engineers and geoscientists, must put the interests of public safety, health, welfare, and the environment at the top. The other aspect of uh, professional regulation and licensure in Canada that's a little bit different than in many other parts of the world is that uh, we have what is called right to practice as well as right to title. So when you get licensed, not only are you um, being licensed to use a title like PN or professional engineer, but you are being licensed to actually be able to do that work. So that means that if you're doing any work that's considered professional engineering or professional geoscience, you must be licensed. So that is the law. It's the Engineering and Geoscience Professions Act is the legal framework that makes it um, a requirement that people get licensed to practice those professions. And if you're not licensed, then you must be supervised by someone who is licensed and who is taking responsibility for your work. So there must always be a, a licensed professional taking responsibility for anything that is considered professional engineering or professional geoscience. And here we have from directly taken from the act how the pro, uh, professional engineering is defined for professional licensure in Saskatchewan. So I'm not going to read this out. You can find the definition on our website. It's a very broad, uh, intentionally broad definition. Uh, so if you end up uh, working in Canada doing anything that would fall under this definition, then you would be required to get licensed. Similarly, we have a broad uh, definition for the practice of professional geoscience in Saskatchewan. So anybody doing anything that falls under this defi definition uh, would be required to be licensed as a professional geoscientist. So in addition to uh, the act providing for uh, the right to practice, it also provides for the perfect protection of the title. And what that means is that nobody can use the title of professional engineer or professional geoscientist or any of these other terms listed here, either alone or in combination with any other word to suggest that they are a professional um, in Saskatchewan. So not only is it the right to practice, but it is also the right to use these titles. So you cannot use any of these titles uh, until you're licensed. And this also applies to the use of the engineer in training or geoscientist in training title. Uh, we, there is no official abbreviation for these. So if you, once you are a member in training, you will be able to use this title, but you must write out the entire thing, either engineer in training or geoscientist in training. And if you end up going somewhere other than Saskatchewan, you'll need to check in that province or territory to find out what the protected titles and use of title is in that uh, jurisdiction because it does vary a little bit from place to place. Uh, another very important aspect of 
uh, professionalism uh, with, is with regard to ethics. So here are a few key points about professional ethics and you'll learn a lot more about this as you go through uh, the process of becoming a professional engineer or geoscientist. So uh, a critical aspect is that you work only in areas that you are competent and if you're branching out into a new area, then you work under the supervision of a competent licensed engineer until you yourself are competent to practice independently. All actions are governed by the code of ethics. I haven't reproduced that here, but you can find that in the Act and Bylaws um, on our website. Uh, and it's very important that you're familiar with that and that you follow that in all your actions. Um, and if you don't, that could be a reason uh, for your license to be revoked. And it's very important that you recognize and support the role of the association as delegated by society. OK, so that concludes the first part of the presentation about the legal framework for professional regulation in Canada. So the rest of the presentation will be um, about becoming a member in training with APEGS. So uh, at this stage, uh, we're really only looking at your academic qualifications. And we know that many of the people coming here and getting licensed from around the world already have lots of experience. And it's not that we're not going to look at it, but we do that in, a, in the next stage. So the first step, we're only looking at the academic qualification. So this uh, definition of academic of the academic requirement comes directly from the Act and it's stated as a bachelor level university program of study in engineering or geoscience that can be recognized by council. And recognized by council means that it meets whatever uh, the standard is that is set out at the time. So to prove uh, their education, applicants must provide certified copies of their diplomas and transcripts by obtaining uh, World Education Services credential assessment. Uh, they may also be required to provide official course descriptions. And depending on the situation, an applicant's ability to meet the academic requirement may be straightforward or it may require significant time and effort. So each situation is different and we do do a very individualized assessment on each applicant. So it, it can be quite variable, the overall experience. So all applicants must apply as a member in training first, regardless of how much experience they have, unless they're already registered somewhere else in Canada. And this applies to everybody, uh, to Canadian graduates as well as international graduates. It's just the process that we have. So if you're licensed as a professional already in another jurisdiction, you can apply through a different process directly as a professional in Saskatchewan. Otherwise, you have to start off as a member in training. So in addition to um, assessing your academic qualifications, we will also be um, uh, concerned about your character. Uh, we don't explicitly test for good character, but if anything arises through um, the process of getting licensed that suggests that you there may be an issue with good character, uh, we would investigate that. And if it if it turns out that there are some issues, it might be, be a reason for your application to be denied. Um, so you can find our good character guideline um, on our website. So the application process as a member in training is all done um, on our website. So you would start uh, on the apply section of the website and go to either the international engineering graduate or international geoscience graduate page and then click on the, the link there to start the application process. As I said, it's all online. In order to be able to finalize the application, you'll have to pay the application fee, which is $210, including 
GST. Uh, and after you've applied and provided um, your WES assessment, we will let you know whether you will also be required to pay the academic assessment fee. And you will also pay that through your online profile. So once you've submitted your application, you'll have an online uh, account with APEGS and a, a lot of the rest of your process will be tracked through that. So for the purposes of APEGS um, academic review process, an international graduate is someone who got their bachelor level university education outside of Canada. So even if you have a Canadian graduate degree, you are still considered an international graduate uh, for the purposes of this process. So I'm going to be talking about our standard application process uh, as I go through the rest of this section. Uh, it's possible that some of you may go through a slightly different process, but this um, is the, mo the process that would apply to most um, applicants. So as I mentioned already, the first step is to submit your member in training application form and fee. And once you've done that, you'll have your APEGS registration number and uh, you will have an opportunity to include that in your WES assessment to make sure that we link up the correct WES assessment with the correct applicant. So you are required to get the ICAP course by course credential assessment. Uh, it's important that it's that particular type because there's important information in that type of assessment that's not in certain other types. So if you've had um, a WES ECA done educational credential assessment for um, immigration purposes, you will have to upgrade to the ICAP course by course. The ECA report is not acceptable. It doesn't have all of the information that we require. Um, like I said, we will let you know if the academic assessment fee is required. Uh, it will be for most applicants. You will also be required to complete a self-assessment and I will provide more information about that later on in the presentation. Uh, if you have graduated in the last 10 years, you may also be required to provide an official program syllabus. Uh, everybody will be required to provide proof of identification and a resume. And in the resume, we're really looking to see an emphasis on any technical engineering experience that you have. Um, project management is OK, but uh, for the purposes of the academic review process, we want to know um, which experience you have that has applied um, engineering, uh, technical engineering uh, theory. OK, so I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time now talking about the self-assessment process. So this is a very important part of your application and doing a careful job on it is likely to produce a, a better outcome. So the self-assessment process gives the applicants a chance to compare their education uh, to the current Canadian educational standards. So for engineering, this would be the CEQB syllabi and for geoscience, it would be the geoscience knowledge and experience requirements document um, that was created by Geoscientist Canada. So it gives you a chance to show APEGS how your academic background compares to the Canadian syllabus because you have a better understanding of your program and so you're providing this to us for guidance to help us understand your academic background. So the committee will take your self-assessment um, as information but they will complete their own uh, academic assessment using your self-assessment for reference. The instructions for completing the self-assessment are provided on the first page of the form. So 
So read through the self-assessment instructions um, and review all the self-assessment tables before you actually start filling out the assessment. So there are actually two tables uh, in each of the engineering assessments, uh, self-assessment forms, and those um, uh, one is basic studies and one is discipline specific. So it's good to read through the whole thing and get a feel for the entire syllabus before you start filling it out. And you're going to uh, cross reference your course listing from the West assessment with the Canadian syllabus. So you're going to write in the name of your course uh, that corresponds with the Canadian syllabus. So it's important that you make your assessment as accurate and complete and explicit as possible because it's going to be used as a guide by the person who reviews your file and you're much more likely to get a timely and fair assessment of your credentials if you've done a good job on your self-assessment. If there's information missing, um, you may be asked to, uh, to redo it and that's going to just make everything take longer. So the first part of the self-assessment is just um, your personal information and information about the, the academic credentials that you have obtained. And this information should be coming from your WES assessment. So whatever the terminology, the English terminology that WES has put in, the, uh, in their assessment is what you should be putting into your self-assessment. And the same goes for the, um, the rest of the self-assessment. You should be using the information that's coming from your WES assessment. So this is what, if you haven't already got your course by course assessment, this is what it's going to look like. So there is a listing of all the courses that you've taken by year and institution. It lists the title of the course and then the Canadian equivalent credit units and the Canadian equivalent grade. So you're going to take this information and put it into the self-assessment in these two columns. So the first column on the left hand side is the um, subject uh, areas of the syllabus and there's a description of the content for each subject area. So these subject areas are not necessarily representative of a course or, or particular courses. They're just areas of related subject matter. And so in some cases it may take several courses to cover all of this subject matter in sufficient depth. So for example, in this case, there are three different courses that have been listed. So the, the year, the course name, the credit units and the grade for all the relevant subjects that you have taken. So in this case, we're looking at the basic studies area, um, the basic studies table, and the first subject there is mathematics. So there are three different courses listed here that cover various aspects of mathematics, and you need to highlight each course a different color, and then um, highlight the relevant content in the subject matter for that course. So this applied mathematics one in green covers these green highlighted subject areas. Applied mathematics two in blue covers these blue highlighted areas and so on. If there's only one subject listed um, to cover a particular topic, you still want to do the highlighting and show which subject matter you covered. It's unlikely that there's going to be a perfect match between the courses that you took and the Canadian syllabus. So we want you to, as accurately as possible, um, highlight the subject matter that you covered in that course that you took. And as I mentioned, there are two different um, tables for each syllabus. So there's the basic studies, which is there to ensure a breadth in um, mathematics, natural science, and engineering science. And these are generally sort of first and second year uh, parts of the program. 
The second table, which is not, uh, I don't have an example of here, is the discipline specific part. And, and it will be mostly third and fourth year classes that are related to the specific discipline of your program. So each table has a required uh, or compulsory section and you're expected to have a reasonable breadth and depth in all of the required subject areas. Um, and then the uh, each uh, table also has an elective section and it indicates how many uh, subjects you're um, supposed to have in the elective section. If you have more, that's fine. Put put the information in there, but the minimum number that's expected is shown in the table. So make sure you put in information for at least the minimum number. So once you have uh, completed your part of the process and provided all of the uh, documents to APEGS, we will be doing uh, an, our academic review process. So although there's a, the credential assessment um, done by Wes, they are not looking at the content from the perspective of uh, engineering. So they're providing information on the level of your program, the length of your program, and the amount of content in your program, but they are not providing any um, assessment of the actual content of it with respect to depth and breadth of, of engineering. So that's what the academic review process is that APEGS does. We are looking to see whether the content meets our requirements for professional uh, registration as an engineer or a geoscientist. So once we've uh, received all of your information, including um, course descriptions, a program syllabus, self-assessment, um, all of those things, if they're required, um, your file will be put what we call in progress, and that means it's starting to go through the review process, and that will be updated in your online profile. It generally takes from three to four months to get uh, a result of, from the academic review process. Uh, it depends a little bit on the details of which process you're going through, um, but that's generally the time frame is a maximum amount of time it's going to take is three to four months for that initial decision. And that decision is not necessarily going to be either you're accepted and approved or you're or, um, rejected it's often going to be communicating some additional requirement, like either exams or um, assessment of work experience or something like that. So the possible results that might come out of the academic review process, the best case scenario is that you will get approved as a member in training. This is not common and would only be a possibility for those people who have a master's or a PhD in engineering or geoscience that is in a related discipline to their bachelor's degree. Most people are going to be assigned uh, exams or work experience reporting. So if this is the result that you get, uh, don't be discouraged. This is the common step in the process. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are obligated uh, legally by the by the act to be very sure that people are properly qualified. So we can't just take your word for it or we can't just assume it. We have to be very sure. So that's why there are things like exams and work experience reporting to back up the academic assessment that we do on paper. So uh, one possible result is that you might have deficiencies in your program, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad program. It just means that it's different enough from what we expect from a Canadian program that there are some significant gaps in it and that those gaps are going to have to be filled by before you can proceed. So Gaps can be filled by writing exams, taking acceptable university level courses, 
and sometimes by prior learning assessment and recognition process, although this is something that is only applicable if certain criteria are met, and this would be determined by the Academic Review Committee as they review your file. So once the deficiencies have been filled, then an applicant would move on to what we call the confirmatory exam stage. Uh, if there are more than six deficiencies in your program, your registration would be denied and you would have to go and get some additional um, academic background in order to qualify and then you could reapply. So the most common outcome is the assignment of confirmatory exams. And what that means is that uh, the review uh, suggests that your program has comparable breadth and depth to a Canadian program. But as I mentioned before, we need to be certain of this. So the confirmatory exams just tests and confirms that the level of the program that you studied uh, is at least at the level of a Canadian uh, university program in engineering. However, APEGS also has what we call a looking to exempt policy. Um, and this means that once we determine that confirmatory exams apply, we look to see if there's any other way that we can uh, exempt you from having to write exams. And the most two most common ways that, that this would happen is supplemental education. So a master's or a PhD in engineering. Um, or valid work experience. So if you have at least five years of engineering work experience with a significant amount of it being technical engineering, demonstrating the application of engineering theory and design, then you will be given the option to have your work experience ass assessed at this stage in order to um, demonstrate that the level of your program was acceptable because you're practicing engineering. So um, if you get that option, that that's a, a great option because you are going to have to do that work experience reporting eventually. And this way you get to do it at a slightly earlier stage and anything that gets accepted at that point will also count towards your professional uh, member application. So you're just doing a step a little bit early. You're not doing an additional work. It's something that you would have to do anyway in order to get your professional license. So once the exams have been written or you've been exempt from writing the exams, then your application will be ready to be approved as a member in training. So it may take up to three or four months to get the academic assessment result. And if you have to take exams or submit work experience, we have a competency based online system now. Um, if you're doing that to try and get exams waived, it may take many months or even years before you get your engineer and training license, but you should get the, uh, the first result from the academic review within three to four months. And depending on the next steps, um, it, it may take a while after that before you actually get licensed as a member in training. So you're not a member in training when you apply. You're only a member in training once you get approved and you will get a letter telling you that you've been approved and that you are now a member in training. So a few other uh, things I want to uh, tell you about before we wrap up here. Um, there's often a lot of confusion about when you can actually start working as an engineer or geoscientist. And although you can't take responsibility for the work until you're licensed, you can actually start working right away if you can uh, find a job. So um, you don't need to be licensed in order to start working, but if you're not, you must be supervised by someone who is licensed and who is taking responsibility for your work. And the same applies to an engineer in training or a geoscientist in training. You must still be supervised by a professional until you become licensed as a professional yourself. 
So although you can start working without being licensed, as long as you're supervised, um, you can't start using the title until you're licensed. So you can't use engineer or geoscientist as a title until you're licensed as a member in training. And once you are licensed as a member in training, you can only use the title engineer along with the engineer in training or geoscientist in training title. So this would be the proper way of using the title once you become a member in training. So you would write your name and then your title engineer in training and then whatever type of engineer you are and whoever you're working for. Um, and remember that engineer in training and geoscientist in training must be written out in full. EIT and GIT are not recognized titles. So this presentation only covered the member in training application process. Obviously, the ultimate goal is to become licensed as a professional engineer, professional geoscientist. So the remaining requirements to be met for professional licensure are the professional practice exam, which is all about law and ethics. Uh, the work experience, you must have four years approved by APEGS and you must meet all the competencies in the online competency based assessment system. You must demonstrate language proficiency um, and you will also be required to provide uh, professional references as part of the uh, work experience reporting process. Uh, APEGS uh, is very careful to keep your personal information confidential. Um, so that means that if you want us to discuss your file with someone else, you need to provide us with written consent um, and name the person in particular. And uh, you can do this just by sending us an email. And this also means that if we're discussing a file with you, uh, your file with you online, we will verify your identity um, by checking uh, with you some of the information that we have um, on file for you. So it's important that you keep that information up to date. We will be doing most of uh, communicating with you via email. So it's important that you keep your uh, contact information up to date in your online profile as well. Uh, and it's important that if you have questions that you ask uh, APEGS, don't rely on secondhand information from your friends. Each applicant has a different background and the process and the result that your friend got may be different than the process and the outcome that, that you get. So um, please uh, check with us if you have questions. Um, all the, the registration information is under the apply heading on our website and uh, this presentation will also be posted uh, on the website under the apply heading on the International Engineering and Geoscience Graduate web pages. All right, so that is the end of the formal presentation and uh, we'll now go to um, the live Q&A session. All right, I just have to find the right. OK, so the first question I'm seeing here is who is required to fill the second column of C2 and who is not? OK, so the, the first column is the syllabus and then the next two columns are intended to be filled <clears throat> out by the applicant. But the second of those columns may not be required for everybody. That's where you would need to provide information about um, where to find the course descriptions in the program syllabus. So if you're not required to provide a program syllabus, you won't need to put anything in that second column. Uh, 
OK, so the next question. I was trained as a software engineer, but have the experience working in civil engineering in Canada. And I want to become a civil engineer. I was told I should apply under software as an EIT. How would that go when I apply for PNG in the future? Would I be denied because of a different discipline between software and civil? <clears throat> so uh, no, there is no requirement for your academic assessment to be in the same discipline as your work experience. Once you get licensed as an engineer, or a geoscientist, you're just a professional engineer or a professional geoscientist. There is no specification about what your discipline is attached to your license. So you are expected to judge in which discipline you are competent to practice. Uh, that's a very fundamental aspect of our professional licensure system. So the only place where it becomes important for your work experience to be in the same discipline as your education is if it's being used to waive the confirmatory exams. So if your work experience is in a different discipline than your education, it would not be eligible for the assessment to waive the confirmatory exams, but it would still be acceptable work experience for the professional licensure process. OK, if I use courses of my MSc in completing self-assessment, does my PhD help to waive confirmatory exams? It, it may. Um, usually we don't do any kind of assessment of the thesis part of um, graduate studies. We only use the courses to um, waive confirmatory exams because we can see from those easily whether they're related and at a higher level than the undergraduate courses. So if you used all of the courses in your MSc and you don't have very many in your PhD, it might not be sufficient, but we will certainly uh, look at it. So we'll look at all of your education that's part of your rest assessment and look at it um, all together in total to see whether uh, there is a sufficient amount of higher level content there to waive the confirmatory exams. OK, so the next question. If there is a gap with the syllabus, Am I required to go through any course or write an exam? Will APEGS recommend a university or other institution to complete the exam? OK, so um, if you have deficiencies, you can either write a challenge exam through APEGS. Um, we offer technical exams twice a year, and uh, so that is one option. The other option is to take an approved university level course. So we do not uh, require those courses to be taken in Canada. They can be taken um, anywhere in the world, but they, you do have to go through an approval process with us to make sure that the institution and the course that you're choosing is acceptable. So it's up to you to find a, a, a situation that works for you in terms of where and when you're going and how you're going to take the course. So we do accept um, online courses taken through um, approved institutions. So once you've found something that works for you, you need to get approval from APEGS to take that course. So you need to send us all of the information and uh, we will determine if it's acceptable. And then once you've taken it, we you need to provide us with um, transcripts directly from the institution to APEGS to demonstrate that you've passed the course. OK, so the next question.
while under supervision of a PNG and things go wrong in the project, does this count on engineering training, future assessment, licensure and approval? Um, so um, not necessarily. Um, obviously, as an engineer in training, the person that is responsible for the results of the work is the professional supervisor. Um, so sometimes, you know, people don't see eye to eye on things and something goes wrong. Um, you know, this may not be the best situation to choose when you're writing up your work experience, but if you have to put that information uh, in there, if you have to use information in your um, edu in your work experience reporting from a situation that wasn't ideal, um, you would you would want to be transparent about that, um, and you would expect that the professional engineer would behave in an ethical and honest manner in that as well. So, um, you know, it's not ideal, and it wouldn't be the best situation to choose. But if you have to, it uh, wouldn't necessarily reflect on you or um, negatively impact your ability to get licensed. OK, I have done diploma and BTEC in electrical engineering from India, but West does not include all subjects of my diploma. They said it is not equivalent to post-secondary. What should I do in a self-assessment in this case? OK, so yes, this is a very common thing that we see not just in India, but in other places where there's a laddering program where you can start out uh, with some sort of a diploma and then add on top of that um, university education to get you to a bachelor's degree. And we definitely um, take, uh, we, we do consider some of the diploma content and you can use anything that's on your WES assessment from the diploma in your self-assessment. But typically, um, we like to see the diploma courses supported by some university level courses as well. So sometimes for basic studies, it might be OK to use only diploma courses, um, but anything that Wes has um, not included on your um, in their WES assessment, so any courses they haven't given you credit for that they say are not at a university level, you can't use those in your self-assessment um, because they uh, we won't consider them as as post-secondary either if if WES doesn't. So um, yeah, we we see this quite often, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't um, be able to qualify. It, it's highly variable. Sometimes. Uh, it, it does result in deficiencies. Sometimes it doesn't. It just depends in detail on the specific situation. So um, do the best you can to fill out your self-assessment with the uh, with whatever West has put on the West assessment. And we do all have a reassessment process. So if you get a result that you don't think has given full credit to everything that you've done. We do have a reassessment process. You you will be required to provide some additional information to to us to demonstrate why you think you deserve some additional credit for something. Um, but uh, but there is a process. So if you didn't provide a program syllabus the first time because it wasn't required, um, you can provide that to us for a reassessment, and then um, we can consider that and. Uh, that may change the outcome. So we, we try to do the assessment uh, without having to get everybody to get a program syllabus, but sometimes um, it, it's necessary in order to, to get um, full uh, credit for everything that you've done because sometimes the just using the course names is not enough. OK, I think I missed something here. This one. So um, is it required for the four years of work experience to be in Canada or does experience outside of Canada count? So you need 
to have um, five years of work experience from anywhere in the world for the uh, process of waiving the confirmatory exams. So for that process, it does not have to be Canadian experience, but it has to be five years, not four. For the uh, professional licensure, you need to get four years of work experience and you neither you either need to have one year in a Canadian environment or you need to be able to meet the Canadian environment competencies. So there are certain competencies in the online assessment system that are required to be demonstrated in a Canadian or equivalent to Canadian environment. So there's two different ways to meet that uh, Canadian experience requirement and we, there will be some similar presentations to this specifically about work experience reporting. So when you get to that stage, I highly recommend that you attend one of those presentations. Oh, apparently maybe there is no longer the one year option. It's only the Canadian experience competencies. One of the uh, other moderators who works in that area has said so. Anyway, you definitely need to meet those Canadian experience require uh, experience competencies. So attend the work experience presentation similar to this to get more details because that's not um, the main area that I work in. OK, uh, let's see. OK, if I move to another province, and I'm already registered as an engineer in training in Saskatchewan, could APEG send information to the other province? So uh, the way that works is that you would apply to the other province and they will ask you as part of the process if you've registered or applied anywhere else, and then they will check with us directly. So you have to sub submit your application there and then they would um, check with us and we would provide any information or documentation that they required. So uh, some provinces, once you're a member in training in one province, they will accept you without doing any additional assessments and some provinces won't. So you need to check with them about their process um, uh, to find out how that works. Okay. Are transcripts for postgraduate studies done in Canada also required? Yes, they are. If you want to get credit for Canadian education, we need those transcripts uh, sent directly to APEX. Would a diploma or degree from Sask Saskatchewan Polytechnic be helpful? Um, possibly, um, but not necessarily, so that that's a difficult one to answer. Um, I wouldn't uh, go and specifically do that to try and help your academic assessment. Do I need to fill out the self-assessment if I have 10 years of work experience? Yes, you will. So on, the way our process works is that we do the academic academic assessment first before we can assess any work experience. So um, that one, uh, everybody has to go through that assessment process to get their work experience uh, to get their academics checked before we can determine whether the work experience reporting option is um, going to happen or not. Uh, how many allowable exams? Can you, you fail? Oh, how many uh, times can you fail a technical exam? Um, well, um, there is no strict number, but if you fail the same exam multiple times, then um, you may eventually, we may eventually say, you know, you don't have the right academic qualifications and your file would be closed. So um, I think that is it for the questions and that is it for our time. We're at uh, 10 o'clock now. So um, I hope everybody found this uh, presentation helpful. Um, 
uh, as previously mentioned, you can also send additional questions to us through the uh, questions uh, dash academic review at apegs.ca email address and uh, we will get back to you um, in the order that we receive your questions and uh, once we've had a chance to look at your file and provide feedback um, based on the details of your situation. So thank you everybody for attending today and uh, have a great rest of the day.